Kia ora once again. It's good to be here, isn't it? Good to be in the house of God, particularly when it's raining outside and, you know, we want to be able to have some warm fellowship. Well, we're going to do that today, looking at the parable of the sower. And the parable of the sower is one of these very, very simple parables which absolutely rips you apart. And uh, when I say that, I say that because I've spent a lifetime working it through because I believe that this parable is a lifetime parable. It's a parable that will measure you, challenge you, and affirm you, and affirm you at different stages of your life. And uh, that's why it's so important for us to see the parables as the words from Jesus that help us to be kingdom citizens and not focusing on the wrong thing. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start by ripping this uh, passage apart. It's from Matthew chapter 13. And uh, what happens is in this parable, Jesus talks about the parable of the sower and the sower who sows seed and it lands on different soils. Later on, he translates it for us, he interprets it for us. But right in the middle of this passage, uh, before they interpret the passage, the disciples have this big question for Jesus. They say, um, what is it about parables and why does Jesus use parables? So the question they're asking Jesus is, what's going on here? Why don't you just tell us things that we need to know? You know, one plus one equals two. Why can't you be more direct Whereas Jesus is going to explain to them why he uses parables. And this is a really good thing for us because once we see the technique that Jesus uses, we understand how it is that it interacts with our own heart here. Okay? So here we are in the middle of this parable, this sort of segue that they create as they ask Jesus this question. See, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you but not to them. Okay, so what we're going to see here straight up is that Jesus is wanting to separate people. And this sounds a little bit brutal, doesn't it? Because you think, well, Jesus is nice and meek and mild and he just embraces everyone. Yes, he does, but he wants you to know the condition of your heart. He wants you to know where you stand with him and the things of the kingdom. And so in every sense, parables are an opportunity to, to sift out the chaff from the wheat, the sheep from the goats. And in doing so, Uh, It gives us an opportunity to see where we are in respect to Jesus, okay? It's a little bit like having a bank balance. You know, you go on your uh, online and you jump up there and you see where your bank balance is at. Imagine if the bank never told you what your balance was like. It would be tough, wouldn't it? Because you'd you'd put your FPOS card in and you'd be going... I know some of you do that anyway. Uh, I do that. (laughs) You know, depends who's got there first. Anyway, it won't go there. Um, So imagine if you never had a bank balance. You'd spend your life in fear as to whether you've got enough or not enough. Same with these parables. They help you understand where you're at with the kingdom of God and with the mission that Jesus has for us. Okay, so Jesus pushes on. He says, whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. Now, this sounds like a riddle rather than a parable, doesn't it? But basically, Jesus is talking to the religious community around him. You see, the religious community think they've got it all sorted. They think they have plenty. And so in the second part of that parable, when Jesus says, whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them, he's referring to the religious leaders of the time who thought they had it all, but he's saying, listen, unless you've tapped into the kingdom here, um, you're not gonna, this isn't about you. This is about, this is about a different way, a third way, a Jesus way. And uh, to those who are on the journey of learning more about the kingdom, they're going, to be have, they're going to have an abundance. And that's what he's saying there. And he goes on. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. So Jesus is describing how it is that people can listen, but not hear. They can see, but their eyes aren't opened, okay? And this reflects the condition of the heart. And this is what Jesus is wanting people to see, is that when you hear a parable, are you the sort of person who just dismisses it and don't allow it, won't allow it to uh, touch your life or measure you in any way? Or are you the sort of person who leans into it and says, Lord, I embrace this parable. What does it say about you? What does it say about me? And what can I learn from it? And Jesus is using this as a way to define those who are kingdom people, kingdom-minded people, or not. But you learn. 
whether you're kingdom-minded or not as well. That's the thing. Jesus already knows where you're at. It's up to you to work out where you're at. And this is what the parable does. Then Jesus says this, For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. So this is a, a promise that Jesus has made to individuals and to the nations, is that if you hear my word, I will heal you. As a nation, as an individual, I will heal you. I will bring you into fellowship with me, which is the greatest healing of all, is that sense in which you can have peace about your own identity, being a daughter or a son of God. But the interesting thing, if you notice there in the third verse, a third line, it says, they hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. When you look at that, you go, well, I know what's happening here. This is a level of intentionality about closing your eyes or closing your ears. Now, if I close my eyes, I can't see anything. But if I put my hands over my ears, I will still partially hear what you're saying. It's true, isn't it? We can never block sound out completely. But it talks about a level of intentionality here. Jesus is saying, look, you hardly hear. Why? Because you don't want to hear. You're covering your ears, but you've closed your eyes and you can't see. So these are people who are giving the, the appearance of wanting to be kingdom people, but they're not participating in it. And Jesus wants them to know where they are at. You have no money in the account. You are overdrawn. Then Jesus says this, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Here Jesus is spelling out for them that in this moment in history, all that the prophets have looked forward to is happening. It's here. The Son of God, the Emmanuel, God is with us, is powerful and present. And you get to experience this. You get to witness this. Blessed are those who have seen and believed Jesus told his disciples, but even more blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. That is us. And Jesus wants us to see that this is a unique moment in time. And so Jesus is calling these disciples up and out and into a life that they would never have expected because it's the kingdom life, not the worldly life. So what parables do is they invite the hearers to take responsibility for kingdom outcomes. And we've already looked at a number of parables over the last little while, and we've found that uh, the parable of the prodigal son, we're invited to be like the son who's repentant, not be like the older son who's angry and dismissive, to be like the father who's embracing and forgiving. Yeah. What about the parable of the, the ten bridesmaids that we looked at a couple of weeks ago? Don't be like the five who run out of oil. It's your responsibility to have the oil in the lamp. And you don't get to steal somebody else's oil. You don't arrive in heaven on judgment day and say, I'll borrow some of your righteousness so that I can pass this exam. That doesn't happen. We stand before God, each one of us individually. We take responsibility for this. Okay, and so these are what the parables are about. They want us to take responsibility. So Jesus then says of what it is that can happen when we don't take responsibility when he said this. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and ears, uh, sorry, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would hear them, heal them. So the question going on here is this, is can you hear me? And when we say hearing, we're not just saying, yes, audibly I can hear you. We're talking about the heart. Does the heart hear me? Now, this might happen at your household, where um, for me, my wife says, Craig, time to take the rubbish out. And I go, yeah, I hear you. I happen to be watching the rugby at the time, and she's cooking dinner and going, hey, um, the rubbish is full. You want dinner? Empty the rubbish bin. I, I hear you. What I'm actually saying is I will empty it in my own good time at half time, okay, or full time. But as far as she's concerned, I haven't heard her. Why? Because I haven't acted upon it. So um, remembering, of course, that hearing is doing. Within the Hebrew culture, these two things are tied together. In fact, the word samar, that is the Hebrew word for hearing, is translated as obey more often than not in an English interpretation of Scripture. 
So hearing and obeying are one and the same thing. But we struggle with that because we're Greek thinkers. We know more than we do. We know better than what we put into practice. That's the challenge we face. So let's have a look at the parable of the sower and let's hear together what Jesus has to say. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Others, sorry, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked him, why do you speak to the people in parables? Okay, so there's the first take on the parable. And we understand now why Jesus spoke to people in parables. So let's move over now, a few more verses, and we pick up how Jesus translates this parable. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. Now, of course, we're talking about 2,000 years ago. And it was very common to see a, a, an agriculturalist, a farmer, sowing seed. They didn't have machinery to do it, but they would liber liberally, generously sow it. <laughs> and uh, in doing so, a lot of seed would fall on the paths, realizing, of course, that the paths were probably only a couple of meters away from each other because when you're doing manual labor, you can only grow so much to reach it, to weed it, and then you have to have another path. And so the path was a common place that the seed would end up. This is a pretty simple parable, isn't it? But what's being described here is that when this seed or this word of God falls on the hard ground, the birds of the air come and take it away. And it's this hardness that Jesus is wanting to emphasize here. It's the calloused heart that the seed is falling upon. And Jesus has no bones about identifying the fact that there are people with hard hearts who for one reason or another have decided they will go their own way. Yeah? You know the most popular song played at a funeral service outside of a church? Anybody want to tell me? I did it my way. I did it my way. Yeah. Why? Because I did it my way. And so let's not talk too much about funerals, but let's press on to see what it is that's going on here. Because people are being told that they have hard hearts when they don't accept the Word of God. All right? Pretty simple stuff. We'll leave it there. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So we've got a lot of joy when we see the uh, shoots come up. And I know uh, many of you, your own experience, my own experience too, was when I met the Lord, there was just an enormous amount of joy. In my life, I had this unpacking of everything that I knew and my life was now making sense. I realized that there was a bigger purpose than me just getting a mortgage, having a family and dropping dead. That life is about um, the kingdom of God and learn all these things. I had a huge amount of joy. The thing that surprised me was that other people didn't get so joyful about my joy. And when I told them about the joy that I had, they did not enjoy my company anymore. And so we found that, you know, persecution kicked in. And this is what this is describing here. It's saying that um, your, your joy might be complete in itself, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Now, the simple truth of it is that we will be persecuted for our faith, uh, not because we see the evidence around us just on evidence alone, but Jesus himself told us that we would suffer persecution. John 15, he says, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. 
Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. And so we're here in this situation where uh, we know that, that we can easily wither when we get intimidated by other people's worldview or their harsh language or their criticism of us or their assassination of our character or the mockery of our beliefs. And so we live in a society like this. How do we overcome this level of intimidation? How do we stop withering in the corner in the smoko room when somebody's having a crack at us for being a Christian? The only way you can offset that is by having larger, healthier roots. And this is what Psalm 1 says. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like the chaff and that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Okay? So we see that we won't wither if we've got our roots deep in the Word of God, deep in fellowship, deep in connection with God and others. And this is where the idea of community is so important for us. We can't do this alone. We can never do this alone. We're not created to do this alone. And I'll touch on that a little bit more soon. But let's press back into Jesus' interpretation of, the, um, of this parable. Because if you think it's sounding tough now, hold your seats. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Here's an interesting dynamic going on here. Unlike the first two seeds that were planted that died, this seed hasn't died. It's there, it's standing, but it's choked, and therefore it's unfruitful. It's not producing anything. And this is where I find the most challenge for me as a Christian because I'm in that same place. I'm alive, but how much am I choked up by the ways of the world? How much am I intimidated by the ways of the world to keep my mouth shut? How much am I overwhelmed by the ways of the world with all of their shiny things that they want to impress upon me to tell me that my identity can come from? That is where the challenge is, isn't it? What does my fruitfulness look like? I can stand there and be totally barren. I can give the impression of a Christian life, uh, but I end up with this uh, fruitless existence. Deceitfulness, as we talked about there a moment ago, deceitfulness, I'll just highlight that again. You see the word, see in the second last line or third last line, this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. Deceitfulness means false promises. And that's the promise that we live on. If you make heaps of money, you're going to be happy. Happy, happy, happy. Okay? That's not true. It's just categorically untrue. And that's much as your happiness and your fruitfulness does not depend upon how much money you've got. There are plenty of people with lots of money who are miserable. Miserable in themselves and miserable with their money. You know, And and we know all these stories. And the simple truth is that shiny things won't make you happy. Okay, The shiny car, you know, it might be exciting for a little while. Uh, The shiny ocean on the shiny white sand, on the shiny boat, okay? These are all the things that attract us and they make huge promises to us. Huge promises to us. You know what boat stands for? Bring on another thousand. I've owned two boats and they say there are two happy days when you're a boat owner, the day you buy it and the day you sell it. Absolutely true. I had a miracle happen. I had a boat that I bought four years ago. I sold it two and a half years later because I had used it twice. My kids had used it twice so it wasn't getting any use, and I thought I'd sell it. And I managed to sell it for what I paid for it. That's a miracle. Right now, I feel like I'm a very blessed man. I own two cars, one right on lawnmower and a chainsaw, and they all work. What more could a man want? Seriously. You know, I don't know what they want. The three sons, and they all work. That would help. But um, anyway, I won't go there. 
<clears throat> but what we've got to notice is how the plants choked, were choked by the worries of this world, worries of this life, but they don't die. They're simply unfruitful. And here is where the challenge lies for all of us. It's like we are allowed to own boats. We're allowed to go on holidays. We're allowed to own houses. We're allowed to have money in the bank account. There's no problem with that in itself. But if that's your reason for being, then that doesn't um, constitute a life that's worthy of the kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying. So if you own a boat, take folks who don't own a boat. Boating. Take folks who don't own a boat and don't understand who Jesus is. Boating. Share your life with them. Have a barbecue on the beach. Say grace as you burn your sausages. And you can celebrate your life in their presence and they get to see a little bit of the kingdom. Yeah. If you own a big car, you know, pick people up. Use it to bless others. If you own a big house, <clears throat> bless it to own, a, uh, own it to bless others. It goes on. So we're all about the kingdom. I'm getting choked up here. <clears throat> Remember this verse from Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we press on. And we see that, that uh, Jesus isn't finished with this parable of the sower. And he says this, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. And, and this is the target, isn't it? We're allowed to have a target in our Christian life. We're allowed to have goals. We don't just wander aimlessly going, praise the Lord. You know, go to church. We want to have goals. We need to have goals. We want to be able to be somebody who's producing something that has a kingdom impact. And this is why we were introduced to Terry this morning. You know, some of you, you know, have a, you know, have a need to go to jail, or at least someone will recommend you do. You know, and, and what about the Alpha course where we've got people working there to help others come to know Jesus? You can get alongside them. We had kids sponsored last week, 57 kids from the community who are going to come to our children's ministry program in the school holidays. That is all about producing fruit. Yeah, I love it. Because why? Because we get to do this together. And the one thing about the, this parable is I think there's a little weakness in it. And I don't say that to say Jesus got it wrong. But it talks about the parable of the sower. The literal truth is for us as a church, is that it should be the parable of the sowers. We're all sowing. One sows, one waters, the Lord reaps the harvest. That's how it works. We need each other. I need those people running that Alpha course. You need those folks helping out with the children's program. We need to see people going, visiting folks in, in prison. And so it goes on. We've got lots and lots of these different ministries. And so that's why for me, this parable is a lifetime companion. When I was first a Christian, I would be earnest in my prayer saying, Lord, don't let the birds of the air take away the seed that's been planted in me. And then, then a year or two later, Lord, don't let this root just wither up and die because I haven't given it enough nourishment. And then, Lord, don't let the mortgages and, and the things of this world overwhelm me. Don't let them choke me into unfruitfulness. That's why this is a parable for a lifetime. But there's another twist to it as well. Because now, having walked with the Lord for decades, my responsibility is to try to put seed in soil that is ready to take it. Okay? I'm not, I'm not going to spend time casting seed on hard soil. I'm looking to say, where are you, Lord? Where are you working? What is going on here? Where is this happening amongst our community? Who is it that we can bless? How can we be involved with what you are doing? Lord, show me the good soil that I can put my time and energy and you can put your time and energy into something that produces the crop of 30, 60, 90 fold. Is that what you want? Is that what you want? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I want that, they say, yeah. yeah but you mentioned boat. Oh, 
Don't know about, ooh, a boat. Yeah, okay. Do I have my boat and eat it too? Yeah, you can. You can. Use it in the right way. But let me talk a little bit more about boats. I'll use an illustration. BBC is like a big boat, all right? And it's got momentum. Thanks, man. But what I'm inviting you to do is not jump in this walker and just cruise along in this boat on somebody else's momentum because there have been people here for 35 years doing this. Yeah, working hard, working consistently. And you can jump on the boat and you say, sweet, you want to check out this boat? It's like a cruise boat. It's got a cafe. It's got good cakes. It's got good music. It's got nice things for the kids. They do a bit of mission here and there. They're running the Alpha course. Man, you should jump on this walker and just have a cruise. Nah, pick up a paddle. Pick up a paddle and put your back into it. If you think that this walker is worth your time here today, pick up a paddle and start paddling. Make this thing go faster. Make this thing go further because you are involved with it. Add your energy to it. Add your prayers to it. Bring your resources to it. This all has to be paid for. God talks about how that happens. Bring your tithes into the church, okay? I'm not even going to mention the capital gain on houses today, okay? Is that income? Does that count on your bottom line? I'm not going to talk about that today. But when I tell you when it's going to happen, I'm sure no one will be here. All right, but in the meantime, paddle. Get involved. This is a boat that's going somewhere and you can be treating it like a cruise liner where you just sit around complaining about the fact that the pina coladas were a little bit off today or you can get involved. Yeah, that is what it means to be in the kingdom. And I know, I look, I know that the church is not the be all and end all of everything about your Christian life. But man, it's a really good place to start and to finish. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. And that applies to today as well. No one could have envisaged what would happen when Christ came and he built the church where his body now is represented by us with this myriad of skills, myriad of talents, myriad of resources to ensure that the parable of the sower becomes true in us, for us, and through us to the glory of God. That's what it's all about. And that's why I say that this parable, the parable of the sower, is a lifetime companion because it's going to challenge you wherever you are. If you're a new Christian, you'll be praying, Lord, don't let the birds, don't let the evil one gobble up this seed. If you've been here just a little while and in the Lord just a little while, keep investing in the kingdom. Keep good company with those who will invest in your life so that you don't wither up and die. Yeah, don't let the weeds of the world choke you out and they can choke you at any time of your life. Just because you hit retirement age, don't think you've got it home and hosed. You could spend your whole life in your motorhome. That's not going to help, you know, unless you've got, I'm doing this for Jesus on the back, see inside for details. Do that. <laughs> You know, seriously, seriously, yeah, seriously, seriously, that'd be fun. I'm sure you'll have lots of good conversations. It might reduce your insurance policy, you know, because you're blessed. So I'm going to finish there. But this parable is a parable for a lifetime. Eh? You see how it is? See how it works? It's not going to let you go. And that's a good thing because it keeps you literally on the straight and narrow in the kingdom of God. I'll finish there. Let's stand for prayer. <laughs> Praise the Lord, eh? Isn't his word good? Yeah. Wow. Lord, we, we do thank you for scripture. Um, the simplicity of a a story about a farmer throwing some seeds on the ground. It's like, we go, whoa, big deal. But then the truth that it brings to the ears that are open and the eyes that want to see, the truth that it brings to the heart that is soft and tender, that will just completely transform us. 
And Lord, for some of us here, we're sitting in the middle of this going, you know what, I'd rather have not been here today. I like shiny things. In fact, shiny things are the goal. Lord, I just want to pray that you'd help us to see that we can trust you, that our life will be filled with joy and filled with fulfillment as we as we give more over to you. Lord, we stand in the tradition of people for 2,000 years have been taking your word seriously and have seen themselves as seeds that are planted and have produced 60, 90, 100, thousandfold in some cases and more. But we also know, Lord, that it's so easy to be distracted. And uh, I know that in many respects, Lord, this, this parable today is a swipe against consumerism because uh, it just challenges us not to be choked up and uh, yet the world wants to, wants to ram it down our throats again and again. Lord, we also pray for um, the likes of Bethlehem College and the intimidation that they're facing in the media. Uh, Lord, we just want to pray that you'd give wisdom to the, the leadership team down there, those who have to speak on behalf of you in regards to the school being a Christian school, a biblical school, a Jesus-loving, Jesus-following school. So help them just to have a simplicity and an integrity in their response. And uh, we pray for the students, Lord. You protect their hearts and minds at this time. They won't see themselves as, as people who are being judged or victims, or, uh, but they just, just, just protect them, we pray. And Lord, for ourselves, we just know that um, we're always going to be challenged by this parable, and that's a good thing. We can go away from here measuring ourselves, measuring the condition of our heart, and, and that allows the work of your Spirit to be freely happening within our lives. Don't let us be callous, Lord. Don't let us harden our hearts and just say, oh, that was an interesting sermon. Craig got a bit excited. We just, I just want to pray, Lord, that this word goes deep because it's your word. So we ask this stuff, Lord, in your name so that you get all the glory for lives that are well lived and produce that 30, 60, 90 fold. Let that be to your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, team.